We sure have seen some generic ass video game names over the years. Medal of Honor, War Fighter, Take On Helicopters, Painkiller, Touch Dick. Recently, Ubisoft entered the inauspicious ranks of moniker misfires when it announced Gods and Monsters. They've since reversed course to call this game Immortals. And you know what? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet if it bloomed into what this could become. A cross-pollination of Assassin's Creed Odyssey and The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. At this point, I think it's pretty important to curb our enthusiasm, especially after invoking the name of what is one of the most critically acclaimed open-world RPG modern masterpieces. Is Ubisoft out to supplant a 34-year-old Apex franchise with this unproven, multi-platform first attempt? I seriously doubt it. Is their intention to pay passing homage to a grandmaster, while also leveraging in a few original ideas and a buttload of leftover Greek mythology homework that they had to do. I think that's more likely. In truth, only the odd gameplay mechanic, an overabundance of physics puzzles, and that painterly visual aesthetic feels similar between these games. After an unfettered two-hour hands-on with Immortals, a game built by a worldwide collaboration of studios too numerous to list, so I'm just going to call it the Ubiborg, yeah, I walked away pleased. Let me now count the ways in which I think that you ought to be keen to play a game they could have also called Odyssey of the Wild, Rise of My Interest Levels. But first, I've got to say that I've spoken for too long. On this channel we deal in two things, the YouTube chapter function that lets you skip to the topics that you actually care about, and sections where I just shut my cake hole and let the game speak for itself for a good amount of minutes. I'm going to do that in a second, but first I want to advertise another Phoenix video that I've put up. It's just basically a non-talking run of me just trying to leg it across the map. No quests are done, I'm just out to show you what the world looks like, how long traversal takes, and what's out there hungry to eat your eyes for jujubes. Anyway, let's talk in a minute. The very first breath of fresh, non-wild air comes to Immortals in the form of it having a voice. Two voices, in fact, and they both love taking the piss. Your exploits are often regaled by Zeus and Prometheus. The former is kind of weirdly out of the loop, but he's also omnipotent enough to know that he's in a video game. The latter also likes to make a fourth wall breaking poke at video game mechanics as well. Can you? Can you not tell this story like I wasn't just there? Zeus. I was literally just there two weeks ago. And even if I wasn't, though I was, 
I'd be listening to your story for days. It's called dramatic effect. It's called where's my skip button. Uh, yeah. Fine. Cute title. Together they have some decent comedic chemistry. It's pretty refreshing. It is actually pronounced Ubisoft. Ah, the French. Now as for the game itself, the Ubi Borg self-describes Immortals as a third-person, open-world action-adventure with RPG elements. It's set in the fantastical landscape of Greek mythology and slides you into the sandals of a human hero on a quest to save the gods from a dark curse while also collecting more crap than a six-armed kleptomaniac. Quick aside, it's worth noting that you can actually re-sculpt your avatar to your liking at any point in the story via the main hub. Now I didn't get to see this in action. Uh, presumably you can alter your gender, skin tone, or your locks. But only if you book yourself a hair appointment. <clears throat> anyway, the home of the OG Olympians, the beautiful and mysterious Golden Isle, has fallen to the most fearsome and deadly titan in all of Greek mythology. Typhon, the titan who was put in the shoe by Zeus for about a thousand years, is now back in Gen Pop, and he's seeking revenge by destroying the veil separating the world of humanity from Tartarus, the underworld. This has, in effect, unleashed monsters with health bars until next Tuesday. Plus, he's captured a bunch of Olympians just to flex. The good news is there's a prophecy stating that only you, Phoenix, a shipwrecked Greek warrior, can save these less than all powerful ones and reclaim their realm. You'll do this by leveraging a butt ton of legendary weapons and unique pieces of especially shiny gear. Even better, much of this filthy loot is imbued with god blessings that allow you to bust out powerful, mythical abilities that become your main source of big, showy, kaleidoscopic ass kickings. Before you can put the boot to titanic sized butts, your low level self will need to hew through hordes of smaller, slightly less dangerous creatures that are ravaging this island. Fortunately, you have access to weapons from some of the most famous Greek heroes, like the Sword of Achilles, which is way better than his foot armor, and you even get the bow of Odysseus. You'll be able to improve and customize said weapons as you gather crafting materials, plus you can discover hidden skins and other cosmetics. Combat is very Assassin's Creed in feel. You can thrash out nippy, light attack combos with R1, and R2 delivers slower, heavier punishment that can stun enemies or just lay them out on their back. Parries can earn you some free hits, but only if you can time a mash of L1 and R1 quick enough. And the code that I played didn't really have an overly obvious visual tell to indicate the more opportune times to do it. I mean, it was there, but it didn't look as over the top as what you get in Assassin's Creed. Robin Hood types can hold L2 to draw a bead on enemies, this can be done via the lock-on system, but you're typically better off using the first-person mode to sink arrows into eyeballs as opposed to doing center mass heart surgery from half a postcode away. You can expect to sharpshoot, I think, more than your average Assassin's Creed outing, mostly because this world is just swarming with these bastard flying harpy things. Meanwhile on the ground, the fisticuffs here is lock-on heavy, dodge roll happy stuff. There's definitely a sweet science to getting in and out of range with enemies that do these obviously telegraphed area of effect moves. It's also worth noting that even triple dodging out of the way can be an inferior tactic to simply zipping upwards on Phoenix fancy wings. Once the danger is passed beneath you, you can kamikaze downwards to resume serving somebody a full six piece and soda to the face. Alternatively, you can just invite your victims upward for an ass kicking with a view. Obviously these wings are invaluable during traversal, but I'm going to dive bomb into that in a second. Whichever way you fight, everything you do is grounded by two fairly generous stamina and health meters. You can either wait for the stamina to replenish on its own, which it will do reasonably quickly, or you can hep yourself up mid-fight by chugging a vial set to your d-pad. Phoenix can become quite the chemist in this regard. My demo build had her stocked with a small Hogwarts worth of health, stamina, and God Ability Replenishing Potions. Better be on my guard.
For those of you who want to unleash some true holy hell, your god abilities reside on an L1 modifier, plus your face buttons. There are some things here that I instantly gelled with. I was a fiend for swinging the mighty hammer of Hephaestus to send multiple enemies flying, or to take big chunks of life off of Gigantors. You can also barge over great distances with the tactical prowess of Athena, and of course the god of war, and I'm talking about Ares, not Kratos, gets a look in with a juggle-tastic spear uppercut. Now, as you save the gods and forge relationships with them, these abilities will deepen via a perk system, which, admittedly, looks kind of sparse when compared to AC games like Odyssey or the forthcoming Valhalla. I'm a bit of a snooper by nature, but a fair chunk of the upgrade screen had placeholder icons with just zero information in them. It's fair to assume then that there's room for greater expansion come launch time. I expect to see a lot more perks centered on Phoenix's Navi-like companion. That mythical buzzard is a great help during combat where he will perform these powerful special attacks to dog your foes harder than Cerberus. Also, as mentioned earlier, you are in possession of the wings of Daedalus, extra limbs that are basically a form of ancient hang gliding. You simply double jump up and tap circle to initiate flight, whereupon the stamina meter pops up to tell you how long you can go before chucking an Icarus into the dirt. Another tap of circle will make you dip into a dive and square makes you boost forward at speed. Both moves are going to deplete your airtime at roughly twice the rate. Fall damage and death are very much a thing. I strawberry jammed myself into the ground pretty easily, for science, and from what I figured was a kind of middling sort of height, so beware. Speaking of defying gravity, you can expect to top yourself when climbing up the many cliffs and crags in this expansive and decidedly more vertical sandbox. It feels like you can attach to basically any wall and auto-climb up it, even if you can't see any obvious assassin-like footholds. And it's important to note that I didn't see any presence of my most disliked feature in Breath of the Wild, that climb-destroying rain. Here's hoping it just never shows up. Now that's not to say that there weren't moments when the sandbox was battered by colossal weather shifts. At one point, I did something to piss Typhon off, and a meteor-spewing volcano in the center of the map just blotted things out with hellfire, brimstone, and it also spawned beasts trying to actively bloodhound me. Once again, very reminiscent of the Blood Moon events in Zelda. When that crisis phase was happening, I more or less stopped traversing via two feet and a heartbeat. Fast moving, summonable mounts were the best way to keep ahead of my pursuers, and it's worth mentioning that Phoenix can collect and equip a variety of these rideable companions. Building your own stable of insta-appearing steeds can be done by finding and taming wild versions of them out in the world. Basically, you just use a bit of stealth and patience to effectively enslave them into an equipment slot in your menu. It's kind of dastardly, but it also has this cool gotta collect them all vibe that I can see myself getting into, especially if there's a Pegasus out there somewhere for me. Wait! How much more of this story is there? Ah! A lot. So send Hermes out for delivery, because we aren't going anywhere.
Alright, let's start to wrap this up. According to the devs, they designed this game around three core pillars, but I'm assuming they actually meant classic Greek Doric columns. These are over-the-top, fast-paced combat against mythological creatures, rewarding exploration via dynamic, risky traversal, and mind-bending puzzles slash world challenges. They say their mantra was to have a journey as challenging and rewarding as the final destination, and gameplay that's easy to understand and fun to master. I think that's a pretty good mission statement, and a pretty potent mix, and I definitely had some fun playing this. Most notably, I was impressed by the sheer size and varied topography of this sandbox. It felt like there were tons of nooks and crannies filled with either more loot and crafting materials, but more often access ways to self-contained puzzle zones. The Ubi Borg is going big here. My first few puzzles were par for the course sort of things like shifting crates onto pressure pads via telekinesis or deftly platforming across timed spiked traps. The more interesting moments involve shooting fly-by-wire arrows around obstacles, and I also use that feature in combat to magic bullet the crap out of some boss who is doing his best to just turtle behind a shield. Like a big cyclopean pain in the ass. All that being said, and while I can find no real fault in this vibrant, stylized world, I've yet to spot any one element of this production that hasn't been done before in another game. There's still potential and time for some uniqueness to be woven into these proceedings, particularly in the puzzle room mechanics and the perk expanding points that they dish out. I'm also really interested to see how deep the basic fighting move upgrades can get, along with the equipment loot game. Two things that, yeah, you can't really gauge in such a short demo time. But look, despite all of its well-trod combat mechanics and deja vu puzzling, I still got a weird kick out of Immortals. Its laid-back approach to storytelling is certainly refreshing, but my instincts tell me that it's probably not going to set the world on fire, like a Typhon tantrum. Mind you, it still runs, plays, and feels as solid as the end result of a staring contest with Medusa. And I think that the sad and simple fact is that some needlessly hardliner PlayStation, Xbox, and PC players are just never going to buy a Switch to experience Breath of the Wild. Ubisoft, then, is providing an alternative means to get a small taste of it, just with a dollop of big fat ancient Greek yogurt on top. It's looking reasonably tasty so far. And what else can I say? When Immortals launches, I really think you ought to see it. <laughs>